Well, there, there is a correspondence. You might know that Eisenstein was very curious about your Museum of the Dead. And uh, reputation says that he deliberately made uh, an excuse to come here to look at that. Um, I think the museum was organized completely different in those days, because we're talking, what, 1931? I don't know, have you seen the film? Because we, in a sense, have rearranged that museum yet again uh, to make it more interesting and photo photogenic. But he was only here for 10 days, so it was a short stay. I think I came here, first of all, to put on an opera, an opera with a rather strange title of 100 Objects to Represent the World. Mm -hmm. We were conducted by an Italian impresario, and first of all, we went to uh, Mexico City, and the Bellas Artes is where we had the opera performed. And it was very interesting that, um, what, two nights ago, we were back there in the same place, in that opera house, presenting, indeed, um, this film. So, in effect, I suppose my knowledge of Guanajuato started at that occasion. And it's very nice to think that we have come round in a complete circle, as it were, and finished back here again. But we've all been saying how strange it is to come back, because it is now two years, yes? yes? Two years. Exactly. And our first impression was how everything smaller looks, everything looks <laughs> smaller. When we shot the film, we tried, I suppose, to make it look very splendid, and all the spaces are very big. But very strange to come back and suddenly feel they will shrunk. Well, you know, the great sad thing was that he was never allowed to edit that film footage. Yes. And I think we could uh, suggest that Eisenstein's particular genius was as a film editor. So unfortunately, we will never know what the final film should look like. Um, I think, I'm told, there's over 10 versions made by Americans, Mexicans, Russians. I think the first version was made by an American woman called um, Seaton, I think, Mary Seaton. And um, his uh, assistant, Ale Alexandra, which we, who actually appears in the film, I think in 1973 he made a version too. But there are, I think, 10 versions. I think I've seen eight of them. I don't want to disappoint you or indeed anybody else in the room. Yeah. But I don't think any of the films are very interesting. <laughs> They're all very much like Mexican, I don't know, sort of uh, travelogues, you know? They're like PR, public relations. Sure, I mean, I think there were financial problems. Yeah. There were big political problems. Yeah. And I think Eisenstein himself didn't help matters by all those erotic drawings that they kept <laughs> finding in his suitcase on the Mexican-Californian border. So I think, you know, probably Eisenstein didn't particularly help his own case either. But he went back very, very disappointed. And for the rest of his life, he was always unhappy that he had not been able, indeed, to edit that, uh, that film. But we still see versions of it everywhere. Yeah. Uh, we were in um, Mexico City, I think, two nights ago, and they were showing yet another version of it. And I heard here in Mexico, some other people are about to make yet another version of it. I think the only virtue is it's an opportunity to show the footage. Even though I believe it was edited in a poor way, at least it's an opportunity to put the footage on a screen somewhere. Thank you. Well, don't you think it is a necessary obligation for all artists to be disturbing. <laughs> artists don't simply want to tell you what you know. We are not here to massage your prejudices. <laughs> <laughs> we are here to show you alternatives. We would use actors like ambassadors to go to places where we don't want to go because maybe we are frightened or we are apprehensive of a reaction we don't like. But I think, you know, if you think of Diego Rivera, if you think of Frida Kahlo, they were provocative too. But you've accepted them now, don't you? Don't you believe these to be very important Mexican artists who are now inside the establishment? And I think that always the most interesting artists to begin with are outside the establishment. So underground artists who come deliberately to provoke you finally get accepted by you. You know that... Uh, 
Russia is homophobic. Mr. Putin feels that the notion of homosexuality is unacceptable. But the rest of the world, as you know, is beginning to come to sympathetic terms with this situation. So I got a lot of hate mail, a lot of vicious hate mail. But isn't it interesting? There's an English expression, if you can't beat them, you have to join them. Eventually, we got invited to the Moscow Film Festival. So you see, it's a question again of notions of perception. My mailbag now is full of invitations to take the film all over Russia. I don't know what you think of the movie in general. I mean, we can talk about homosexuality, we could talk about Eisenstein, we could talk about you know, Russian communism, but I would like to think that you would regard the film as being very celebratory. It really is a film film. It really is a piece of cinema that really reflects what cinema is. It's very quickly moving and brilliantly acted by these gentlemen. And it is, um, I suppose, an exposition of the filmmaking art. And although it's, it's, a, it's a sad love story, they consummated their relationship, but it only lasted 10 days, and I this time had to go back to Russia. So in a sense, it's a sad love story, but I feel there is a great sense of jubilation about the film, and um, I get the impression from all the people who've seen it all over the world that they probably would agree with me. I've now written two more scripts about Eisenstein. One is about uh, when Eisenstein went to Switzerland in 1929 and attended the world's first film festival. Uh, the second film is going to be called Eisenstein in Hollywood. So it is actually about Eisenstein's adventures in Hollywood. And we probably will be filming it maybe in September and October, maybe a lot of it in Mexico City this year. 